afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another Barometer webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. And joining me today, as always, is our Chief Investment Strategist and President of Barometer, David Burroughs. On today's webcast, we will be pleased to provide you with a brief macro overview and, of course, be delighted to address your questions at the tail end of the conversation. So don't be shy. Email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the Zoom link where you can put in your questions in the Q&A or the chat. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pam. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Look forward to your webcast today. Well, I'm, I'm at home today. I came home early uh, to get organized to take my three girls to go see Justin Bieber tonight. And they are all destroyed that he's canceled the concert for tonight, tomorrow. So oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I got we three love, sad girls. We love Justin Bieber. Well, I guess they can <laughs> go to Tim Hortons and, and help themselves to some um, uh, Bieber, Tim Bites or Bieber Bites or whatever they are called. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. Anyway. Okay. Well, well, we got lots. We got lots to, to cover here. So, uh, so why don't we? Why don't we blast off? Uh, we're we're going to work from a high level as as usual. Uh, but you know, it's interesting as this market is making progress. Uh, we're about uh, two weeks off the May lows, uh, and market is uh, slowly uh, but surely putting one foot in front of the other. Um, just to, to to quickly remind you, I mean, at the end of the day. I think that we have three basic jobs. If, if 80% of return comes from getting to the right asset class and 20% of return comes from finding the right sectors or themes within those asset classes, we really have to understand the big picture in order to make money. To, to buy a, a great house in a bad neighborhood never makes you money. Uh, and so we try to obviously find specific securities to express our view. Uh, and so we have three sets of tools that we use in our, in our decision making. We have this top-down market, market risk, sector risk, asset class risk allocation model, where we're looking for parts of the market that are seeing improving breadth, where there's better and better participation in the form of a rally. Uh, and at any given time, there might be some a, a few key themes. We don't need to be everywhere. Our job isn't to be in every sector and every market. Our job is to, to identify sort of where outsized opportunity lies and where money's getting put to work. Within those groups, we have to find ideas, specific situations where things are good, getting better, where those securities can be revalued versus their peers within that neighborhood. And if we do it right and address each of these three key factors, we have a portfolio that is relevant kind of in the current market environment. Then, of course, the third piece of the strategy is probably the most important piece because there are changes always taking place in markets. We always constantly have to reassess market and sector risk. We have to constantly reassess whether the securities we're using continue to have the characteristics that point to good getting better. And, and so that third piece of it is a very disciplined inventory management tool where we have to be good sellers uh, because good companies generally continue to get better. However, things change and we do have to be able to pair out, and sell off the, the weak inventory and replace it with, with stronger participants uh, when markets go through changes. So with that in mind, just a quick highlight sort of where we are from a top-down perspective. We think we're in a structural bull market in stocks that started in 2012. That was when we exceeded the highs from the bull market that ended in 2020. And while there are short, sharp pullbacks in a structural bull market, they tend to go kind of four steps forward, one step back. A lot different than one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back is what you get in the structural bear market. So when we look at the, the uh, last little while, we know we went through a correction from the end of December through May. And um, while it's still out for debate, we have a view <clears throat> that we have come to the natural end date of this current correction. And while there can still be bumpiness going forward, it's fully in line with what tends to happen during a structural bull market. You know, corrections come in time or in price. We've had a combination of both. We've had several months. In fact, <clears throat> we know that in the NASDAQ, the damage started in February of 2001. So that's arguably 16 months that we've been through. Uh, and but markets, markets are starting to heal. Uh, 
Um, when we look at um, whether or not markets are priced in a recession, whether or not we get a recession, we know that during structural bull markets and the ones that are highlighted are corrections that market went through due to the fact the market, the economy was going into recession, they tend to be 15 to 20%. We got just a snip over 20%, 20.8% 20 20 in the S&P. Uh, and so our view is that we remain in a structural bull market. From a rates perspective, we think we saw a generational low in yields in 2020 at the COVID low, and that we have seen a reversal or generational shift in the direction of rates. Uh, much like we saw in the early 1950s. And coming out of the war, there was the first bout of inflation in 1951-52 uh, as the demand picked up as people came back to form families. Uh, it wound up being quite cyclical, that, uh, that inflation. It came in small waves, but long-term interest rates started rising in 1951 and continued to do so until 1981. But it took 15 years to go from uh, 1.6% on a 10-year treasury bond to 6.6% in, in 1966. And during that period, you know, the stock market rallied very nicely. So uh, when we look at rates, this is the yield in a 10-year bond. Uh, this is going back to 1981. This is the very sharp rally that we saw. In fact, I could make a case that rates were in the process of putting in that generational bottoming, uh, 2016, 17, 18. <clears throat> course then ultimately we wound up with the COVID sell-off in 2020 that derailed that uh, and here we are back above the long-term moving average for rates now that's a very long-term moving average 200 month moving average and as we've been saying we expect it kind of to consolidate in and around here we don't think the rate increases are done we do think longer term bond yields are going to go higher which is why we are so bearish on the bond market um, one of the other interesting clues that we've seen recently, we know that China went into recession, you know, before the US, well before the US market started to correct. And 10 year yields have made a significant turn in China recently, despite the fact that their economy has slowed. And this is probably on the back of a COVID reopening. Uh, and in fact, the Chinese central bank becoming more accommodative, putting stimulus into the system. Uh, but the fact that China's rates are turning, we talked about Germany's rates turning, we talked about England's rates turning, we talked about Australian rates turning, really rates have made a turn around the world. In the two year, actually in the last two weeks, our Canadian two year yield actually now made new highs as, has the, as the Aussie is pushing towards new highs. So rates continue to be a challenge for bond investors. We continue to be in a bond bear market. And as a result, we've seen bond prices fall sharply. So that's the 37% fall in the TLT, long-term US uh, Treasury ETF. Now, interestingly, we, what we often look for to see the end of a bear market is capitulation or people to become massive sellers of that asset. This top chart is a chart of the aggregate bond index in the US, that's all issuers and all maturities. Despite the fact that there's been this massive sell-off in price, last month, the month of May, saw the largest net inflows into bonds in history. So what does that mean? It means people haven't given up on bonds. It means they are going back to the old playbook as to what to do during falling interest rates, long-term falling rates, and they've said, I'm going to buy this dip. This bear market won't be over until people are selling the dip. There have been almost no outflows out of bonds, despite the fact that the aggregate bond index is down 15% as of the end of May. Looking at it another way, the rolling 40-day sum of money going into all duration uh, bond uh, holdings, ETFs, is at a record high. So I think you have to say it's unlikely the market bottoms when everybody decides it's bottomed. It will likely disappoint. So this is one of the reasons we continue to be quite defensive on bonds. And in fact, in the last week, we replaced our short position after the bonds had had their little bounce uh, we've, we are reshort the bond market, the 10-year, the 30-year, and the seven-year U.S. Treasury bond. 
Now, on the other hand, interestingly, we have seen capitulation in equities. This is uh, retail investments uh, in equity purchases, where you can see that after a big run up in private investor purchases in the stock market, during this correction that we've seen, all of that cumulative money has come right back out of the stock market and more. So where I have not seen any capitulation in the bond market, we have seen capitulation by retail investors. And we saw that in sentiment. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago, sentiment reaching multi-year lows. We saw positioning get much more defensive and we've seen a lot of flows out of equities. So of course, people want to question whether it's at all possible the market could have found a bottom despite the fact that we have concerns about a potential economic slowdown. But it is interesting that we've seen capitulation in equities while we haven't seen it in stocks. Now let's move, sorry, in, in, uh, uh, in equities while we haven't seen capitulation in bonds. Okay, moving on to commodities. Uh, we talk about the fact that we think we're in the very early stages of commodities outperforming stocks. And when this starts to happen, it tends to go on for a long time and it tends to be very significant outperformance by commodities relative to equities. And that is exactly what we continue to see. This is the month by month movement of the RJI equally weighted commodity ETF. And I know this gets repetitive to put it up every week, but it just continues to chug along. And interestingly, the flows into commodities remains very muted. In other words, investors have a hard time believing in an asset after it has been in a protracted bear market that went on almost 15 years. But the bull market and commodities continues. This is the RJI Commodities Index daily chart. We know that since March, we've seen a consolidation while the stock market went through its significant sell-off. And actually in the first couple of weeks of strength in risk assets, the commodity index went on today to make a new high, both relative to stocks and in an absolute, on an absolute basis. Now it's for good reason, because we talked about the fact there's a structural shortage. People had concerns that because China slowed down, there would be a reduction in the demand for copper. And despite the fact that China was, was in a slowdown, copper, as we sit today, is at the lowest inventory levels in the last five years, sorry, seven years, despite the fact China went through a slowdown and now they're reopening. So each of these lines represents the calendar year inventory levels. And you can see at the end of May, if you take all of the previous number of years, we have the lowest inventories on record. Now China's reopening that probably has positive implications for copper producers. So here's the S&P, the corrective period that started the beginning of the year. We put in a low about two weeks ago. We had one, two, three days where over 80% of the companies in the market were up on the day and 80% advanced days. This doesn't happen all that often. And when it does, it tends to be significant. Now, interestingly, we rested for two days and then had a 3% follow through day uh, on Friday of last week. So that's what we call a follow through day. We look for a thrust in breadth, we look for a rest, and then we look for continuation. So what's happened when this happened in the past? This is from my friend, Chris Cavacchio. When you had back to back to back 80% up days since 1968, these were the results going forward. If you looked out six months, overwhelmingly the market was positive. There are two exceptions, 1980 and 2009. Both of these periods during secular bear markets, we are not in a secular bear market. We are not in a credit crunch. These two were in secular bear markets, but even including those, if you took the average of all the occurrences since 1968, the market was up 12.8% on average six months later. 18% nine months later, and 22% one year later. You can do the math when you look out two years, three years, four years, and five years. So overwhelmingly, the odds are in our favor that the market is signaling that we saw a market bottom. Now, we don't make our decisions this way. We make them based on our breadth models, but certainly this is supportive of the fact 
that we, we may well have seen the bottom, despite the fact investors remain exceedingly bearish. And even though the market did have the type of correction it would tend to have, even if we were going to have a recession. Now we talked a couple of weeks ago about the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ had come down to the 150 week moving average. And since then the market has had a bounce. It is somewhat unconvincing. We remain below declining long-term and short-term moving averages. We may well see follow through from here, but at this point it makes us less interested than we are in the S&P and the Russell 2000. This is the NASDAQ comps that on a longer term basis going back to 2020, and you can see the relative strength line versus the S&P has been falling since February of 2021. In other words, relative performance of the NASDAQ continues to underperform. And I know that people like to go back to what worked before, but when you go through structural shifts, like from disinflation to reflation, probably what worked previously is not going to lead going forward. And it still appears that that is the case. I'm not saying that the NASDAQ can't rally. It just does not appear to be the source of leadership in the market. Now, we make our decisions trying to identify parts of the market where over time, a higher and higher percentage of stocks are participating in a rally, expanding breadth. We're happy to be invested in sectors and themes and asset classes, and geographic regions when we see expanding breadth. There's no bear market ever took place while we saw expanding breadth. Similarly, though, when we see deterioration in breadth or fewer and fewer stocks performing well, that ultimately turns into a market decline, we aren't prepared to put on new money and put it to work. So where do we sit as we stand? On May the 10th, all of our long-term indicators were negative. Percent of stocks in uptrends in Canada, negative. Percent of stocks in the U.S., in uptrends, negative. Percent of stocks globally in uptrends, negative and weakening. All of our short-term indicators were weakened. Percent of stocks above the 50-day, percent of stocks trading with positive momentum, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, and percent of stocks trading above their 150-day or 30-week moving average. All of them had been deteriorating for weeks. Since then, on the 17th, the short-term indicators started turning positive. On the 24th, our long-term indicators turned positive. And as we sit today, virtually all of our long-term indicators and short-term indicators are positive and improving. This gives us license to be invested. This gives us license to try to identify sectors and themes that all show are showing expanding breadth and strong relative performance, both during the decline and now on the advance. On June the 7th, as we sit, the percentage of stocks in uptrends around the world, all of these in green are showing expansion. It's a very different picture than what this looked like a month ago. And over the course of the week, if we took the average across all of these countries, another 3% of stocks joined the rally, moving up to 38%. This percentage got well below 30% in the low 20% range at the worst point in May. So let's look at leadership. Well, I'm starting to sound like a bit of a broken record, but energy continues to lead the parade. This is the XEG TSX capped energy index today, closing at a new high, trading better than 97% of all the individual stocks in the S&P 500. Over the course of the last 12 months, we made a new relative and absolute high today, as did the XOP, which is the S&P oil and gas exploration and production ETF made up of a basket of large cap and mid cap energy exploration and production companies. Relative strength has been strengthening all year long through the decline and of course on the recovery. That is the sign of market leadership. Now it's not just producers, it's service companies. This is the OIH, oil service ETF, companies that provide services into oil and gas like drilling and transportation and so on make a new absolute relative high today of almost 3%. These are the transportation companies moving, moving oil through pipelines of 1.5% to a new relative and absolute high today. And it's probably for good reason, despite the fact that Joe Biden decided he would empty the strategic petroleum reserve and has been moving millions of barrels out of the reserves. We now have the lowest inventories that we've had in many, many years. The seven-year average inventory at this time of year 
closer to 2 million barrels. We're at 1.6 million barrels uh, and falling. So there is a structural deficit that cannot be made up with a strategic petroleum reserve. And when we look at the number of wells being drilled and the productivity of those wells, they cannot come close to offset the shortages being created coming out of the reopening of the global economy and of course being disrupted by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So how much money has gone into energy? This is a year-to-date sector ETF flow chart. So the further along the right axis we go, the more money has flowed into that neighborhood. So you can see actually only two sectors so far this year have seen net inflows or new investment getting put to work. Utilities, which of course makes sense, is the most defensive sector in the market, the one that is least impacted by the economy. So if the concern is recession, you might put money there looking for a dividend. But energy has had on the y-axis the greatest return year to date by a lot, but still sitting, sorry, it's the greatest return, positive return, but with very low flows into the sector. So sectors, sorry, like healthcare, staples and technology have seen more money flow in to ETFs than energy, despite the fact that energy is way outperforming. This would speak to the fact it may well be that while it's performing well, people are not positioned. And there continues to be lots of money that can flow into the group and it, it continues to be a relatively small part of the market. Some of the companies that we have in our top 10 holdings, Arc Resources, just continues to chug along up 5% today. Tourmaline, which we've talked about many times, continues to chug along and Synovus Energy. But our energy exposure continues to grow and we recognize that there is a diversification factor that we have to follow. We have energy exposure in transportation, in services, in producers, in oil, in gas, but there is very clear and resilient uh, leadership in this group. Let's move on. Materials. Materials continue to move higher. This is the materials ETF, FXZ, made up of steel companies, miners, uh, agricultural uh, fertilizer companies, um, metals companies of all kinds, uh, cement companies, relative strength rising all year long. It's a reflationary asset. We own the producers of these products, so they have pricing power, and we're trading very close to new highs for the year. Within the materials sector, the miners, which you talked about running into support four weeks ago, are now lifting very consistently. And we've only just come out of a very long-term bear market for the miners. So we think that this is very early stage. Same thing on the uranium producers. Today, the Biden administration announced that they would like to invest over $4 billion in establishing US-centric uh, uh, supply of enriched uranium. So it was a big day for the uranium miners, Cameco, Next Gen Energy, uh, the uh, uh, uranium participation units all were up between six and 12%. The steel producers right off the hop in this rally have come back very sharply, including companies like Cleveland Cliffs and Stelco, which we own, and the agricultural companies continue to perform well. So materials continue to lead. There's the forest products. Let's move on to the dividend theme. Relative strength continues to move higher. Investors continue to look for an alternative to bond investments, something that might give them some dividend growth. This is the FDL ETF. It's got a 3.4% yield and has grown its dividend over the last three years by 10% a year. We expect it to accelerate from there. And of course, the, the combination of resources and dividends, the large upstream producers of resources, BHP, ExxonMobil, Archer Daniels, Rio Tinto, Valley, and so on, continuing their relative strength march higher, almost back to new highs. Keeping in mind that the S&P is still down close to 14% from the highs, the NASDAQ is down 23% from the highs, leadership sectors and themes should move back to highs very quickly, much more quickly than the market. They should be more resilient on the way down and they should rally more sharply on the way up 
It's exactly what's happening here. Okay, so within the income uh, cohort, we talked a little bit about infrastructure companies. These are companies like pipeline companies, uh, companies like um, uh, railroads, companies like uh, uh, airport operators. And infrastructure continues to be a focus for investment for stimulus around the world. One of the new themes that we've been a little bit more focused on the last little while is construction and engineering as it relates to builders of infrastructure. And once again, this is a group that came down less during the decline and has rallied sharply and gone on to make new highs since the rally began. So this is supportive of the infrastructure theme. It's supportive of reflation, price setters, not price takers. Moving on to financials. We talked last week a little bit about financials doing better on a relative basis. The insurance companies we highlighted, stronger relative strength versus the market that continued this week. Uh, the banks were also a little stronger this week. We took the XLF relative price performance since the beginning of the year has outperformed the S&P. They are performing a little bit better. But again, going back to flows, flows have been solidly out of financials. So what happens if you don't have this outsized outflow out of financials that have caused it to actually just slightly outperform the market over the course of the year? Even if flows neutralize, it's likely that this group can significantly outperform. We talked about over the last two years, the fact that financials have only just recently come out of an extended bear market. This is more likely a pullback on the way higher. So let's look at the groups that we own less of. Well, the industrials represent a smaller part of our portfolios. We do, as I think most people know, have a pretty significant stake in defense stocks, which fall in the industrials category, and they make up almost our entirety of, uh, of industrial holdings. This is the ITA Aerospace ETF, made up of companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing and Textron and so on made new relative strength highs today, up almost 2%. <clears throat> so clearly leadership continues here. We're also seeing new strength in some of the equipment companies like Caterpillar, which would make sense. If we're going to build more mines, we're going to need more Caterpillar equipment. And so infrastructure spending is good for Caterpillar and Deer, as is improvement in agriculture, as is improvement uh, in basic materials. So let's move to the other groups uh, that have been small uh, relative to our rest of our holdings. Uh, technology doing a little bit better, continuing to relatively underperform. Uh, consumer discretionary, again, a little bit better, but not really making any change in the relative strength theme. Uh, we take communications, again, the same picture, still way, way, way below the, the highs, almost 30% off the highs, in fact. A small uptick in relative price strength, nothing to do here. Uh, and uh, the value theme. So value continues to outperform as well. So the purpose of doing these webcasts is to talk about what it is that's causing us to build the portfolios the way that we are. Our job is to make sure that the portfolios continue to reflect current reality, not to say what we think should happen, but ultimately to be in the things that are working. And when things stop working or they start behaving in ways that we don't expect them to, be prepared to step back and move to the sidelines. Very clearly, since February of last year, growth has relatively underperformed value. And that continues to be a theme. So a month ago, if we took all of the sectors that we track from a breadth perspective, most sectors had almost no stocks and uptrends. Where we sit today, it's a very different picture. Almost every sector is in capital letters, meaning that breadth is expanding. There are several that are performing better on a relative basis. They include things like forest products and oil service and oil producers, uh, gas utilities and banks. But we are slowly seeing improvement. Whereas only 20% of stocks were on, in uptrends in the average sector in the beginning of May, it's 40% today, twice as many stocks in uptrends and that continues to march along. We don't have to be everywhere. We need to focus on leadership. We're always looking for new leadership to emerge. At this point, we're seeing some new leading emergence in financials. 
And then, of course, when things stop working, we have to be prepared to play defense. Now, I had a question over the course of the week <clears throat> about the fact that sometimes when we go to the sideline, we're going to trigger a taxable gain. And I'll have the same conversation with that investor as I would with somebody who owned Nortel in 2000. Nortel went to a sell signal for us at $124. The sector rolled over and we believed that the bull market and growth stocks was over. Now, when the market rallied a few months later, it didn't help growth stocks much. And of course, we know that Nortel eventually went to zero. So at the end of the day, sometimes it's better to pay tax and make the right sell decision than it is to hold a losing position. Now, certainly the, the tech stocks have had a little bounce over the last couple of weeks, but I would far rather have taken the money from tech or taken the money early in the year from financials and moved it to energy where they have marched higher all year long and we think can march higher for a fair ways longer. So selling is important. You have to make the business decision before you make the tax decision. You have to be tactical. Here's where we sit today. Energy continues to strengthen its lead in our, as our largest weighting in the portfolio. And while some might think, well, you just continue to buy them, Dave, <laughs> they in fact continue to appreciate and they are becoming a larger part of the portfolio naturally. Financials are a relatively new weight over the last three weeks as they've started to behave better. Consumer staples remain in the portfolio from a, from a dividend perspective, as do utilities. Industrials are largely focused in defense stocks, communications, um, healthcare, tech, technology, consumer discretionary and real estate continue to be very small parts of the portfolio. We have a very bifurcated portfolio. But I'm glad to say virtually all of our portfolios are in solid plus uh, uh, position so far in the year and are positioned well to benefit going forward. Now let's look outside of the US. <clears throat> let's look at the Canadian dollar for a moment because lots of people are interested. Isn't it interesting that coming out of a long period of consolidation, the Canadian dollar broke out and pulled back much like the metal stocks did, much like the steel stocks did, much like energy did, but now moving higher. So our guess is Canadian dollar can continue to move higher, which is why in our pools and funds, we remain 100% hedged back to Canadian dollars. In our separately managed accounts, we focus more on Canadian securities because we think we get a tailwind from the currency. Outside of Canada, we continue to see improvement in Japan. And I know this is an unpopular market. It hasn't performed since 1991. They've been dealing with disinflation and deflation ever since. But perhaps this is one of those markets where inflation is a good thing. The currency hedged Japan ETF DXJ today closed at a new multi-year high. And this against a pretty weak global economic backdrop. The other thing that we're noticing, and we talked about this last week and the week before, is China starting to show improvement. This is the K-Web, Crane Share CSI China Internet Index. It was down 80% from the highs when it bottomed at the beginning of March. It's made higher lows since then, and relative to the S&P basis has turned higher, as has the Chinese market itself. <clears throat> and when we look at the things that we care about to call changes in a, in a, in a, a market situation, when we looked at the second half of 2021, they had very constrictive monetary policy. They were tightening fiscal policy. Property market was in difficulty. Um, they were very focused on decarbonization and, and being restrictive there. They were focusing on cracking down on tech and obviously had a very, very strict COVID policy. We are seeing improvement in each of these categories. So the share of GDP or population percent of GDP that is under lockdown is now falling. So China's reopening. And the percentage of people over 60 who are uh, boosted is rising. So we think it's possible that China was the first country globally to go into this market pullback. It's also possible it's one of the first to come out. We think that has positive implications for our basic materials and energy themes. 
And for the portfolios, we now have a small percent of exposure in China. In our macro portfolios, we continue to be focused in energy materials, dividend stocks, commodities, agriculture, and so on. But as we talked about last week, we've added exposure in Japan, we've added exposure in China, um, and we have just recently put some fixed income shorts back into the portfolio. So we've all seen a ton of volatility over the course of the year. When we look by year at the percent of days where we had more than a 1% move top to bottom, 2022 is right at the top of the pile. Now, that's caused people to pull in their horns and be cautious. But it also is representative of a market that is resetting up for the next leg of a rally. I think this is as important. The spikes in volatility have slowly been coming out of the market since the beginning of May. And at the close today, we're at the lowest level we've been at a couple of months. So whether this is a summer rally that runs into a little more bumpiness in September, October, or whether we have put in a bottom that is sustainable and we will just steadily work our way higher from here, nobody knows. I think if we follow the process and continue to do this day by day and share it with you week by week, you'll see that ultimately it's about having a portfolio that's set up for the current environment. And I think right now, as we sit, we're really well positioned. If things change, we've shown a history of getting defensive in tough markets, just like we did in January, February this year. So with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thank you so much, David. We do um, have a few questions here, so let's get to it. Bob wants to know, David, how are the bonds doing in the balance and um, income portfolios that we manage at Barometer? It's a great question. So really the bond position that we have, we have to in our balanced portfolio have a minimum of 20% fixed income in that portfolio. If we were bullish on bonds, and say bullish on corporate bonds or long-term U.S. government bonds, they would be sensitive to interest rates. When you are bearish on bonds, you keep the maturity very, very short. So we have very short-term bonds by high-quality issuers. So we don't have really much by way of interest rate risk. I give Jim Skatakis huge credit because he's focused in the bond portfolios in, in for Barometer. And he has had positive returns over the last year in the bond portfolio relative to the worst year for bonds in the last 30 years. So it's very, very conservative and we only own bonds where we have to own bonds. The only other place we held them was very, very short term bonds where we held some cash during the recent market decline, but that ultimately gets redeployed and has been mostly redeployed since then. Thank you so much, David. Um, we have another question here from Laura. She is wondering whether you think that this investment into bonds is a view that a recession is looming. I'll leave you with that. Yeah, I think that there's, I think that there's some possibility in that. And I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong. But what I would say is, it is almost never that everybody decides to buy an asset at the bottom. It just doesn't happen that way. So there's a lot more to this than just is there a recession or not. Now, my guess is probably people have become too pessimistic about the economic outlook. Um, but I think it's more that people see this as one more opportunity like they had over the last 40 years to buy bonds after they pulled back. This pullback in bonds is very, very different than any other pullback we've seen since 1981. So I would suggest that um, it is highly unlikely that everybody after a pullback gets their buy point exactly right. I think it's, I think it's very unlikely. I think it's more telling 
that investors are flocking out of financials now at a time when we're seeing some marked improvement. Thank you, David. Lawrence here has a question, David. He wants to know how much of the energy is price appreciation as compared to new purchases? Well, we've had, we've had very, very good uh, performance in our, in our securities. I mean, I'll, I'll just share, uh, share a few of the, the names. Let's see here. So, you know, if we were to run through some of these, you know, we talked about tourmaline. Sorry, there we go. So, you know, tourmaline, tourmaline's moved from, from uh, $40 to $80 so far this year. Uh, companies like CNQ, Canadian Natural Resources, you know, having a, just a tremendous year, uh, up from 40 to 70. Uh, other small cap names, uh, 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 Baytex Energy, which is a large holding for us, you know, just going parabolic. We're, we're getting a combination of both. And, you know, the question always is, do you sell your most productive asset just before, because it's doing well? Uh, we don't tend to do that. Um, we do believe in holding on to your winners and cutting your losers short, um, especially when you get into the kind of market that we're in. It's hard for us to see how the structural deficit in the market can change. And if prices for oil were to go to $150 a barrel, these will all double again. And I think that's very possible. Thank you, David. Switching gears, Nutri. Oh, that's my dog, Max. He has something to say. He's upset about the Justin Bieber concert being canceled too, David. Um, <laughs> Nutrien has dropped like a rock. Could you explain why? And does Barometer still hold that? Stock? Yeah, we, we certainly hold it. And, and, you know, it has pulled back. It's pulled back. We talked last week about a lot of these things having pulled back into the long-term moving averages. And that's exactly what Nutrien has done. It's pulled right back into the long-term moving average. I, I would expect it to see it hold in these levels. It did have a very straight up move. Uh, so, you know, bull markets are not easy to, to stay in, uh, but this is not technically broken in any way. And, uh, and I'd be a buyer of the dip. Last question here, David, are you more favorable to US financials or Canadian financials? And is Barometer invested in both? Yeah, I think we're interested in both. Um, we have more exposure to Canada currently because of the Canadian dollar uh, for separately managed accounts where we hold individual securities for clients. You know, we, we cannot hedge currency, so we'd prefer to hold the, the a Canadian equivalent. And the Canadian banks have performed quite well. Uh, so from a financial standpoint, they're hitting their numbers. Uh, from a relative performance standpoint, the shares are performing well, and we don't have to take the same currency risk. Um, I think that if we believe that commodity prices remain firm, and it's possible they firm more rapidly now that China is reopening, then the Canadian dollar is likely to strengthen. So we got to take that into account. Thank you, David. Well, that concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. And as always, I will leave you with the final word. Yeah, you know, recessions come and some recessions don't come. Um, the old saying is that economists have called, you know, seven of the last three recessions uh, because, because they're often suggesting that we have recession where we don't wind up getting one. Um, even if we are going to get a recession, we think the market is discounted a lot. And we think that there are certain industries that are likely to do well, despite the fact you could have some slowdown due to inflation. We want to own the, the sectors that benefit from inflation. So by the time everybody calls all clear, markets will be a lot higher. So we just have to go day by day and say, is the incremental data improving or is it weakening? And at this point, it is improving. And we did get on many measures to quite extreme levels in this sell-off. So we'll continue to take this step-by-step. Step. Um, I would encourage uh, you, if you've got questions, to give us a call and have a conversation. 
I know we don't necessarily cover everything in these webcasts that you might wonder about, or you might like a, ask a question privately. There are no dumb questions. Please give us a call. Uh, I'm happy to jump on the phone. The counselors can get me at any point. Uh, the counselors are happy to get your calls. Uh, and if you've got questions about anything that's outside of barometer, happy to answer those questions too. So with that, thanks very much, everyone. Have, have a good evening. I know my daughters are going to be disappointed not to go to Justin Bieber tonight. I might be okay. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Not the Libra, Dave. You got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> have thanks, a great everybody. evening. Have a great Thank week. you.